Stuart, I'm one of the new surgery regis at the uh, New Yorkshire Humberdealy. And I'm Will, I'm one of the uh, core surgical trainees also in the auction Um So I suppose w- w- the idea of this was that we were going to uh, help out new starting doctors on a neurosurgical firm. Yeah. We're kind of aiming at, you know, um, junior SHOs, F2s. Yeah, and maybe core trainees. Yeah, um, core trainees and, and uh, advanced nurse practitioners or anyone who's working on the day-to-day working of a neurosurgical ward. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Just to make it a bit of a smoother, smoother ride in and something that's accessible um, to those externally um, rather than waiting for your induction day, something to quickly yeah. watch in. Really. Um, so I, th- I, I, we, I think in terms of the structure of it, we're going to go through what the normal working day was like, uh, just to kind of, that's the, the traditional induction thing. And obviously everyone's trusts are going to be slightly different for that. Um, but and then we're going to move into talking about um, what uh, the important things you need to know about cranial neurosurgery and the important things you need to know about spinal That's neurosurgery. Not, yeah. Just so you can kind of start engaging the thinking process when ordering scans, looking at blood results. Uh, that, that's kind of the point, I think. Yeah, most of it is the smooth running, isn't it? And, and being able to have a grasp of why we're ordering a scan and what we're looking for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. I suppose we had a few caveats, didn't we, obviously? Yeah, some, some important things um, really doesn't replace any local induction that you're having, doesn't replace you doing further reading, right. um, or the preferences or views of your consultant, the medical team or senior colleagues in your department, wherever they may work. And we don't represent the Yorkshire Hand, but do we even though we work within it? Yeah. You know, uh, it this is really a, um, a, a personal project that we thought yeah. might help other people and anything that we can do to kind of smooth that process out, hopefully to, uh, to help you guys. Excellent. So I've obviously been working with the team here for six months with you here. Um, so I've got a bit more of a grasp of things than someone who was having an induction. But um, I think I've got to, I know what questions I had at the start and that I was asking you at the start. So I think if we almost ask, if I ask you of that, then we can, that would probably be the best way. Sure. Yeah. To, if that's okay. So um, to start with, it was just going to be talking about the structure of a typical day for a surgical SH, a neurosurgical uh, SHO. Um, uh, so obviously, the start of the day for everyone uh, uh, is it in every trust you've worked in? They have the morning handover meeting. Uh, yeah, so it's a little bit different in neurosurgery, I guess, to most other surgical specialties, or particularly the medical specialties. You have a junior doctor handover that takes place a little bit separately to the whole, uh, uh, I guess, uh, larger morning handover meeting. And that's just so make sure that various different things are communicated at a junior level, i.e. patients to come in, any urgent scans, um, and also just clinical priorities on the ward. So for example, morning cortisols um, need to be taken at 8 a.m. and often that uh, can be a little bit difficult around ward rounds and uh, coordinating that as well as any emergency scans that are going to displace any first elective scans in the morning need to make sure that they're happened and, and handed over to chase yeah yeah so it, you, it would generally be that the junior team would hand over those more ward-based jobs blood scans etc that need to be chased or done urgently or or, or um uh, yeah stuff and, and, and sometimes that that happens in a war round as well depends yeah. on the unit yeah yeah, yeah. and then uh, or simultaneously or ideally just after uh, then you would attend the senior handover the, the morning meeting yeah with consultant presence at that meeting yeah and that would generally be um, the registrar presenting the cases that have been referred over the last 24 hours um, yes exactly yeah. and then obviously consultant input and uh, that's an important thing I think for a junior to attend because a lot of these patients that are discussed are not actually yet in the hospital they're often in peripheral services that are being referred in yes yeah. um, but obviously they're going to be very important because over the next however many hours or days those patients are going to start coming to the to the hospital and that's what's going to determine what you do when you clerk them in 
So you, you need to be paying attention at that point to know what's going on, really. Yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes it's quite easy just to think, well, you, I mean, it, it's it's twofold, really. You get to learn how to interpret scams and also the ver- not only the management of different conditions, but also the variety of management yeah. um, that, that can happen with some conditions. Um, and then you also just need to make sure that you're paying attention to note down uh, what, what, what's, what that means for you as to clocking in patients. Yeah. So um, I suppose after that meeting, um, you um, go on to the ward round. And uh, it, where we are, we have two wards, a more acute unit, uh, which is almost like a step down from ITU, uh, uh, which has got a higher nursing to patient ratio. Yeah, and, uh, then, and then a lower level ward, which is often called a level one, level one. ward, ward yeah. where you have at least a six to one. Yeah, a patient to nurse ratio. So our ward round would usually start on the level, the higher level uh, setting uh, ward. Um, uh, generally, the night person joins us for that because we want a full handover from what's happened over the last twenty four hours. Um, and that I think on those level one wards, we try and be a bit more uh, rigid with our assessment and uh, recording in the notes yeah so some not every unit does that but yeah so i think if we take the level one ward round and what that means um because what you want to do is make sure that the ward round is efficient and what you need to do is almost give everyone a job on that ward round yeah so um someone's looking at the observations the drug cards someone else is looking at blood revolt uh, sorry blood results and scans there's a Staff member of staff from nursing and someone from physio and OOT representing what progress they've made, yeah. And then someone or two people often um, doing medical documentation, yeah, yeah, alternately, alternately, yes. If you've got enough staff, that's the perfect thing, yeah, yeah. That, that is it, yeah. and that is probably the best way to organize your round. That usually will be down to the junior to try and put that organization in place. Um, if you can tell whoever you're with those jobs you'll find that you don't, there's less things that are missed. Yes, uh, yeah. Um, and if you've got a spare medical student, um, then a jobs book is useful just to make sure those jobs are collated. Um, so th- this was kind of uh, talk, thinking about what, when you, when you first go into level one setting, particularly if it's like your first day, knowing what to write is it, quite difficult, I'd say. Yeah, it's. It, I would say it's a very surgical documentation and ward rounds a little bit quicker. So you want to know the diagnosis, when they've had the surgery and how many days post-op they are. Yeah. Um, it's important, even though you're scribing, to flick back to look at the op note and see whether all of those have been done. Um, and often someone else will be telling you what the news score is or fluid balance or anything, any changes on the news chart. And then often the... I, the senior registrar or sometimes consultant on the ward round will be uh, testing the patient's neurological status in GCS as well as any focal deficits. Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess the um, you've got obviously the, you've got that person documenting, and then you've got someone else looking at the OBS chart. Yes. And the key thing with the OBS chart, obviously, looking at the OBS score, the new score, it's worth telling the person who's documenting that, but. Also looking at the fluid balance, sometimes that's quite crucial. It is, yeah, especially for some neurosurgery patients. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's very critical. So I, I guess we'll go into the pathology and the importance of fluid balance chart in the next section, um, but that would be important here. And, and then, so when you're looking at a drug card, what, what would be the key things you're looking at? Um, so delta parin, whether it's prescribed or not, and depending on um, the condition of the patient and what they've had done, they often will start delta parin post-optively at right. some stage. So at least that's communicated to the decision maker, who's often the cons- uh, consultant or reg on the ward round. Dexamethasone is a weaning plan in place. Often we start with high dose and then wean down, and um, it just it's best to note whether there is actually a weaning plan in place, whether they've got a gastro protection with a PPI and ADCAL or bisphosphonates if they're on long term steroids. So yeah, so whenever I see DEX, I always think, have they got, because it's often this, isn't it? So they yes. must have a PPI, they, they must 
have some sort of decision about when that's going to be. So yeah, uh, I think Oca- occasionally they, they will wait for um, a reaction and then start to decrease it. But the vast majority of patients need to be weaned off the highest dose. Yeah, down to roughly two, one or four milligrams once a day. So yeah, so I think the two ones that you big highlight as a junior, you look at the drug card, if they're not on delta parin, you tell the senior that they're not on delta parin every yes. day, because yeah, yeah. every day the decision can be made whether it should be started. And then if they are on dexamethasone, you tell the senior they are on dexamethasone, just so that every day it's considered whether it should start be put onto a weaning dose. The same thing is true for anti-epileptics, particularly Kepra. Yeah. There's some um, use to just use some seven days or at least uh, to be reviewed in clinic same goes for antibiotics as well as sedatives which are often used in some form of uh, advanced neurosurgery uh, operations or particularly the long ones or head injuries um, as well as any anticoagulants and look if it's a post-op patient think do they need to restart an anticoagulation yeah yeah um so i guess in a level two environment a uh, level one environment they, they may be sedated as well, uh, so level level one is the normal. Oh, sorry, level sorry, one, yeah, level it? three. Yeah. Uh, le- level three, yeah, they're, mm-hmm. they're mostly well. They should be intubated, ventilated. So it'd, it'd be worth looking at, you know, putting that in the notes. I guess what 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 level what 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 effect is that having on their, you know, alertness? Yes. Um, so if they're on, if they're on that, yeah. Okay, um, so. So that so, kind of completes level one. Yeah. So, all oh right. So, yeah. So it, we're moving into like a level two or level three setting. So that's like an HDU or an ICU, basically. Yeah. Um, most people tend to go for an ABCD approach because it's just easier and structured. Yeah. So what the airway is, that doesn't tend to bother the neurosurgeons too much. But obviously, uh, for long-term patients, we'll look towards putting a trachea in yeah. um, or ask the anaesthetist to... Um, so that's an important consideration. Uh, obviously, they're breathing. You want to look at what what breathing status they are. are they spontaneously breathing, and um, is that is continuing to get head the right way? Um, the main one for uh, that new surgeons concentrate on is uh, if there's a MAP target and what MAP are they currently attaining, mm. um, because we tend to drive patients, particularly those that have uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages that are non-traumatic and aneurysmal. We would um, we want to try and reduce the occurrence of uh, the old-fashioned term as vasospasm. Yeah, yeah, most most used word. Yeah, yeah, and that, and the that's always really key to document in your ward round because that needs to be communicated to the anaesthetic team, to the ITU team because that's what they're going to be targeting, obviously, for using for the rest of the day. Um, so, including that, obviously. You, I guess the, this is when you have to start thinking about when patients would be wanting to be stepped down to a lower level as yeah. well. Um, and and part of that is based on whether they've got any breathing or cardiac requirements. If they have either of those, then they don't step down. Yeah. Um, if they've got disability, for example, if they've got poor GCS, but they've, they've successfully extubated, then we'd still look to maybe step them down for an IC, from ICU to HDU. Um, and then you know, don't forget um, describing disability and GCS with words, not numbers. Ideally, yeah. um, look at other things like focal deficits, and that's what the reg or consultant on the ward round will be assessing. So often we'll reassess, even though there's a nursing assessment, yeah. we'll uh, formally repeat it on the ward round to see what they're currently doing, and then compare that against the sedation, um, whether on some romafentanil or propofol or something like that. Yeah. I always remember when we went into uh, when I went into ITU for the first time. When you see patients that have EVDs, um, yes, it's something that when you first start, you just uh, it's something that I think is a scary device to to have to approach. Um, I guess the importance of it is it's connected directly to the ventricles, isn't it? So it's a direct yeah. So it stands for external ventricular drain. So I think with the knowledge that it, it's right, it's placed often at the, almost the centre of the head. Yeah. Um, it, it always invokes uh, concern amongst neurosurgeons that 
you can create lots of complications from poor management of, of an EVD. Yeah. So um, don't forget that you know even if you change the height of the bed, change the angle of the head of the bed, uh, the EVD is, is is basically draining based off a off a set um, height, yeah. and if, if that doesn't change often, if you change the height of the bed. Um, and you can often overdrain them or um, they can block off as well. Yeah. So uh, and they also record the EVD output on the fluid balance chart? They do, yeah, they, they, or, or something similar to that, yeah. So um, in paediatrics, you should replace that fluid. Yeah. Um, in, in adults, it's more looking at how they're not, how much they're not absorbing, if you like, depending on the pressure that you're letting it uh, yeah. eject out at. And then, um, and then, if they're making steady progress, then you can look towards channeling again, and you can also see from the from the fluid um, whether they're at high risk of needing a shunt, or whether it's too bloody or too proteinaceous to even consider shunting at that stage. Perfect. So um, that's I think that's pretty much everything for a level two or three setting. We have got some more information on EVDs in the next cranial section um, yeah. and uh, other drains or ICP rocks that you might see. Well, clearly because you're quater either a quaternary or tertiary centre is mainly ensuring patients are referred back to their local hospital because for a couple of reasons um, they need to have their care organised locally yeah. um, and in order to get back home um, and also it's better for all their relatives that they're close to home. Yeah, and it can so, be a long journey away. You know, yeah. some patients travel a hundred miles to to get to uh, their new surgery centre, which is quite a quite a um, toll after you know, being in hospital for a couple of months. Yeah, it, that's why I think it, as as a junior, I would always prioritise that job. Uh, obviously, um, clinically on well patients, I would prioritise. But if you've got enough members of the team and you ident identify someone on the ward around who needs to be referred back, sometimes it's worth peeling that member off. So you go and refer back earlier in the day uh, yeah. rather than later because then it takes it takes hours to arrange the transfer. So if you refer them at four o'clock, they're yeah. not going to get moved. Well, and by the time the bed managers actually figure out there is a space, they yeah. don't. You know, they, they work out that though whether there's spaces in any of their hospitals yeah. pretty early on. So the later you are, the less likely you know it's already been filled, yeah. and um, they. Um, they don't know at that stage. It's a super quick job as well. It's just a case of phoning the hospital, going through to the team that's most uh, best place to look after the patient. Um, you can always ask the registrar who that would be. Uh, speaking to their accepting a referrer, a receiver, either a registrar or someone's a consultant. And then once you on there, just make sure it sometimes takes so long to get through. Make sure you write down that you've done that because yeah. uh, they may need to be rediscussed with the following days. Um, and I think you need to make sure you write down which hospital, what team, and what's the accepting consultant who's looking after that. Yeah, and sometimes it's a reg, but also ask for the on-call consultant. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you need to record both. And then once you've got that, write in the notes and tell the nurse in charge, because then they can start phoning that hospital. Yeah, and chasing their bad managers. That's really important, because yeah. often you can do the job and then it doesn't... Doesn't, nothing doesn't exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Some places, uh, I think they use online referrals, uh, particularly for like, uh, I know we, we hear to specialist neuro rehab centres will use like an online referral. Yeah, they will. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's just worth being aware of that for your local trust, I guess. Yeah, and some the, for spinal cord injuries for all the regional spinal cord centres, uh, so, sorry, spinal cord injury centres, they'll use that national system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I think quite early on you want to, once you've done your acute, uh, you've booked your scans, you've taken the bloods, you've done your repack referrals, yeah. you want to start thinking about discharges because that takes time, you've got to get it to pharmacy. So uh, I don't need to go through what discharge paperwork involves here. Um, but uh, I think the key things for transfer letters are, um, you know, the, particularly things like um, uh, summary of why they came in, but also any details of any procedures they've had, post-operative instructions um, for those for those times, and then and then also thinking about things like what the expected prognosis is. Often receiving hospitals won't know that. 
Yeah, that, that can be quite difficult yeah. and uh, might not always be difficult. Uh, that might not always be uh, documented. No. Um, so we can't always document that. No. But I think the other side is for um, newer rehabilitation centres, for them, they often want to know extra things like NG feeds, tracking weaning plans, what's been tried with the NG feed, you know, has uh, what salt assessments have been done. And they're easy to forget because we commonly don't as medics get involved so much in that side of things. Exactly, you need to talk to a therapy too. What we do get involved in a lot is the meds and getting them absolutely accurate is key on both discharge paperwork and on transfer paperwork. Yeah. Um, the key things I think are steroids, you know, no one should really be discharged or transferred without a steroid plan. Whether it's yeah. whether it's that it's going to be reviewed by a specialist on a set date or reviewed by an MDT, or they're on a weaning dose, but all of that needs to be communicated really clearly. Um, the modipine also is something we start and, and a stop date. So stop date, yeah. some of them won't stop, and uh, they'll then be followed up often by the new oncology nurses in the same hospital as the new surgery team. Yeah. And there's a cl- close liaison between the two, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's either, you almost need to say, and the plan is when either when to review it or when it's stopping. So, yeah. um, the same yeah. is true for, well, nimodipine is yeah. a standard 21-day 20 dosing days. regime. So. It's very important to, to inform the pharmacy or the referring the re- receiving team what day that started so they know what day to stop it. Yeah, and to be fair, even when patients go home, you know, we, we're often requiring it to be given for hourly and throughout the night. So for... Patients' families, they're waking their um, relatives up at two o'clock, six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And if they're doing that for, you know, excessive amount of time and for extra week or so, it's, um, it's, it's pretty horrible and, and it really knackers out patients. Yeah, definitely. I guess we often quite, uh, patients that get admitted here often stop anti medication, you know, we stop anticoagulation medication. Um, so having a start date, a restart date, for that's important as well. Yeah, um, yeah, for the GP. Um, uh, a couple of other points that I never miss off a of discharge only with the neurosurgical patient, particularly cranial is driving advice, DVLA advice. Yeah, that's really key. Um, one medic legally um, that we've actually informed the patient that it's one their, um, their their responsibility to contact the DVLA and notify them. Yeah. Um, and. Um, also for their safety, really. and uh, yeah, also for their safety. Plus, if they're epileptic, just give them genetic that they've been given generic um, yeah. seizure advice. Spinal patients is not as important as a general rule. I would say they're not safe to drive until they can perform an emergency stop and that's check their lungs. Yeah, that's non hesitated and for particularly if any cervical problems yeah. that they, they can, can turn. Check blind spots. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. So but although the I guess the some insurance companies slightly differ in when they're able to. So I guess the well, the official advice would be that they have to check with their insurance company, but yeah. the generic one would be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then obviously checking the op note um, for whether there's any guidance on when the patient's uh, whether the patient has any undissolved, uh, non-dissolvable sutures or staples yeah. that need to be removed. I mean, the common rule of thumb is seven or ten days for. Uh, a first operation if it's a redo scar or they've had radiotherapy or chemotherapy they might extend that out to somewhere like two weeks if uh, it's a redo and they've had radiotherapy which can happen with the GBM patients yeah yeah and then key thing would be follow-up arrangements and sometimes there's not necessarily a, a, nece- a direct date for their follow-up it will be a case of histology is going to be reviewed in MDT and then the follow-up is going to be arranged. But, but yeah, again, if, it, if it's a spinal patient and it's a standard microdiscectomy, then there's often a, a standard um, six, eight, ten week follow-up. Yeah, but that information should all be in the operation now for you because uh, individual surgeons have individual preferences. Yeah. Um, so then I think once you've finished those more jobs, that's when new admissions start coming on in most units that tends to be later in the day or in the evening uh, because that's how long it's taken to get the beds moved around um, so it's quite a big difference from admitting as an SHO uh, admitting an elective patient or a, an emergency patient um, obviously an emergency patient um, uh, usually requires a more thorough workup um, whereas an elective patient has already been reviewed by a senior and uh, a date has been arranged 
Yeah. Um, and it j- just routine for an elective patient here, what I would do is uh, document what procedures planned and what date and time that's for. Um, just do a, a full medical clerking of you know comorbidities, regular medication, any medication that's been omitted in time for selective surgery, so it's not forgotten. Um, writing up analgesia, making sure they've got prophylaxis for the thromboembolism, the VT prophylaxis done, and then everyone should have an upstate set of bloods and two group and saves. Here yeah. we will accept that that's 28 days. Um, yes, it's, it varies, doesn't it? But and it then... varies. And also group and saves also vary as well because uh, here they'll accept within the last 28 days as long as they haven't had a transfusion or pregnancy within that time. But generally I'd say it's worth checking the transfusion department um, yeah. Yeah. making sure there's one there so it doesn't delay their surgery. The key ones are nil by mouth. Um, right. Uh, most patients, elective patients, know that they're going to be nil by mouth, but uh, often if you give them the instruction that they'll be commonly nil by mouth from for eating from two, yeah. and then depending on when their operation is, it'll be a couple of hours before that they're not drinking clear fluids. Most patients have been pre-assessed, but some are like an urgent elective, so they haven't actually had a pre-assessment. So they may need other investigations, might they? Yeah, they might do. So particularly the new oncology, it's, it's more of a... You know, the week before, they, they may have been discussed in the MDT and that even earlier that week, they may have um, seen one of the neurosurgical oncologists. Um, and they've, they're, it's quite a kind of fast turnaround yeah. with, with everything. So they might need ECGs, chest X-rays, um, even ABGs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then consent and site marking for surgery is usually done by the registrar or the consultants yeah, um, yeah. but that just you just need to flag that up to the registrar that might need to be that that should be on their radar absolutely um, emergencies um, uh. so the only key person and point to take that are different in new surgical clerking uh, versus any other medical or surgical ones are really as follows so in demographics uh, as well as their age, don't forget dominance, whether they're right or left-handed. Occupation always um, plays a particular role in neurosurgery because of the effects we might have on their cognition. And then weight is very important, uh, and that might be relevant for either getting them in MRI scans and or getting them onto certain operating tables and setups have certain weight limits. Um, if it's an emergency admission, when they last eight who their next of kin contact is, um, is is absolutely vital because we may need to contact them, particularly if it's consent form for an, an emergency procedure. Presenting complaint as always, past surgical and medical history. The pertinent point there is to look at whether they've had any previous neurosurgery, particularly if it's pre-1997 and a CJD risk because we need to uh, quarantine the uh, instruments differently and manage the sets differently according to their risk and uh, then moving on to drug history um, particularly pertinent points of the allergies and if they're on any anticoagulants or platelets and when certain medications were stopped and omitted then as uh, any other medical standard clerking is uh, social history family history and uh, for particularly paediatrics and childhood history, um, you may have to get a collateral history from witnesses or rel- relatives. And then you'll get used to doing a little bit of a tailored neurological examination with cranial nerves, fundoscopy, upper limb, lower limb, cerebellar and cerebral lobe examination, as well as um, particularly as the SHO completing that with a systematic review of cardiorespiratory, abdominal and any other um, systems you feel is pertinent to the case. Um, and then don't forget all the drug card stuff, so analgesia, antiemetics, laxatives, um, anti-thromboprophylaxis, uh, bloods, swabs, now including COVID, ECG, chest x-rays, check they're on the operating list, check with the on-call registrar what their instructions need to be, whether they are already nil by mouth or whether they want them to be new medications they want uh, to start as well and a DNA CPR status should be um, at least it's useful to have that documented and or a functional history um, 
and then obviously going on from that, the reg or consultant does the consent and site of surgery marking. So I guess when your days come to the end and you're wrapping up, just a final thing that I would say, make sure you've checked all your blood results are back, you've written them in the notes so they're there for the ward round the next day. Um, you've documented uh, in the notes everything you've done, uh, particularly any um, accepted uh, referrals. Um, and you've ordered the bloods for the following day. And, and then also just making sure that fluids and medicine is written up for the patients overnight, um, because you don't want that to be missed, particularly with patients that are very dependent on that intravenous fluid to uh, maintain their fluid balance, yeah. uh, which is very important. We'll go into that in the cranial section. Mainly subarachnoid patients, but yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, um, should we go through this so I guess that new surgery is a little bit different um, they're tertiary referral centres you don't get too much teaching in um, med school about all the newer surgery aspects um, or conditions yeah. and so we, we kind of ask the juniors particularly the new ones to be asking us and their uh, colleagues yeah. and, and the, I think the key is get consultant and SPR contacts their numbers yeah. um, and shortlist the key telephone numbers things like CT control MR control um, so you know who to you know quickly call so you're not waiting through switchboard every time Absolutely, contact, yeah. don't you? Uh, there's an app in the, in, this, in the UK called Induction which is really good for that it's a free app that has, a, has that available um, I I think this is uh, neurosurgery is one of the key things where I remember on one of my first days, um, you know, I couldn't get, I couldn't get through to the registrar and I just went straight through to the consultant, uh, you know, because the registrar may be busy and if it's an urgent thing, you don't you don't hold off uh, for the registrar to become available. You could cons consultants are much much more readily available on their mobiles, but on call. Yeah, especially the on call. The on call. So, um... <laughs> Sometimes the, the reg is either dealing with something uh, happening in theatre or in a different part, you know, you'll often have uh, the t three levels of uh, ward patients and therefore you might be in one area sorting out an EVD and you're trying to sort out another issue. So, that, you know, there, there's often no, there is, there is clearly a hierarchy in, in, in the management, but... Um, but juniors contacting consultants consultants particularly want to just know and that, that's absolutely fine to contact yeah. them and they expect to be contacted even by the juniors if the regs are busy yeah absolutely i think the other thing is is that um things that may be very simple on in, in other specialties are actually very complicated in neurosurgery so managing fluid balance uh managing electrolyte abnormalities um managing uh, different medication uh, anti-epileptic in, uh, steroids etc they're, they're all so much more specialist and um, uh, you've just got to be careful that when you're asked by one of the nursing team can we do this that you're definitely comfortable uh, authorising that and you don't need to speak to a senior about it um, and I would say that's why I think we're doing this presentation to kind of highlight those high risk areas where you may be asked something and inadvertently uh, act as if you weren't on neurosurgery and actually you probably should have progressed with a bit more caution. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, that, that probably leads us quite nicely to this. Should we?